see many people. Do you, this is not about generative AI. I think just yeah, just to be clear. <laughs> so um, yeah, today uh, I want to present something that uh, I really care about because I did a lot of experiments. I had the chance. And I was quite lucky to work with Polaris a bit, and it would be just a small comparison. Let's see what we can learn out of it. So first of all, there would be an introduction about pandas, if you don't know what is it. How many data scientists here? Okay. How many of you know Polars? I think we don't need this presentation. Anyways, it's good for you. Uh, so we will dive into pandas, uh, why everything started, what is it exactly, things that we don't like about pandas. Um, there will be a small introduction about Arrow, which is needed for the presentation. Um, and then we will dive into this uh, very simple comparison. Uh, about me, um, I work as a data scientist. Um, I'm currently located in Hamburg, but I'm originally from Italy. And uh, what I'm doing now is a lot of dynamic pricing, but, but I, I've been exposed to many domains, um, also ride hailing in the past. And uh, yeah, if you want to have a chat later, feel free to reach out. Uh, basically, why are we talking about this? If you don't know, uh, Pandas is basically everywhere. Uh, it's part of a lot of job listings. If you check Coursera, it's full of uh, classes about Pandas. So it is definitely something big. And we use it for data cleaning, transformation, machine learning. Um, probably, as we, we're going to see later in the next slides, that it wasn't meant for all the things that we're doing nowadays with pandas. Uh, but we're trying to adapt to the needs that uh, we have today and all the needs that uh, we got in the, in, the, in the last years. So how everything started. First of all, uh, pandas means panel data system. So it's not a Pokemon name. It, 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 it stands for something. It means something. And everything started because this, this guy, Wes McKinney, in 2008, wanted to um, implement something flexible that was a mix of the things he was using back then. He was playing with R, he was playing with Excel, and he needed to incorporate this into um, Python. He needed the, the, the power of Python to do the things that he was used to do. And the main pillars of his solution, so Pandas, uh, were basically coming from his needs. He needed a uh, data analysis tool in Python. So Python has a lot of flexibility, and he was like, why I cannot use it for my time series problems, for instance? And then why I cannot use maybe something that already exists? We're talking about NumPy, and, and, and try to build something on top that is flexible, that allows me to play with time series, I have indexing and all this nice stuff. So the key components, as we know, since I imagine that we all know pandas, are the data frame and the, and the series. The data frame is just a 2D, two-dimensional labeled uh, data structure. And under this, this um, data frame, we have these so-called NumPy series. And that's pretty much it. So this is the main motivation. Pandas today, so we started with a very small project. Now fast forward until today, and we see that Pandas is everywhere. It's part of Dask, Seaborn, Matplotlib. It has a lot of contributors. What's really nice about Pandas, and probably this is why Pandas had so much, so much like success, is that, and so many contributors, is that Pandas is uh, mainly implemented in, in Python. So if you, want, if you know Python, you can easily contribute to it. This was probably the main reason why it became so famous at some point. And Another important slide before diving into what I like and I don't like about Pandas is uh, Pandas 2.0. This, this was probably one of the most important things from last year about Pandas. Pandas 2.0 introduced a lot of things I was looking forward. One example is PyArrow. We will see what is it in the next slide. And a lot of new things that actually prove that the community wants to go in a specific direction. They know what is not working in Pandas, and they're trying to fix it as much as they can. Now, let's dive into the library. First, uh, we say that Pandas is fast. But what does that mean exactly? The first thing I have in mind is that um, it's built on top of NumPy. So you have these really nice C-optimized libraries 
under the hood, library under the hood, um, that is not C, but it works almost like something that is compiled in C. We will see that there is a difference. Uh, you have this very efficient data structure, so you have these pandas data frames. When you do um, operations against a pandas data frame, everything is fast. You have this super fast indexing, and it works like magic. And one of the reasons is because we have this uh, site on under the hood, which is not like C. It's something pre-compiled. If you know how compilers work, it's not that you're compiling stuff. You're compiling code in your machine. But it's something that is pre-compiled, -comp pre and you're using this pre-compiled code, which is very fast. It's not like compiling something on your machine with C, but it's very fast. And this is why we say sometimes that we have C under the hood. It's not true, but definitely we have something that is almost as fast as C. And one example of the magic pandas is probably if you try to create a list, as you can see in this example, and you try to time it, you will see that there is a huge difference if you do the same operation with NumPy and um, also apply a sum, time it, and this under the hood has a completely different implementation because here we're using Cyton, we're using a lot of things that are optimized for these operations. On the other side, we're just using Python. But at the same time, we also ask ourselves, what makes pandas slow? And the first thing I have in mind is uh, the problems that I usually have, and I imagine you too, with the memory. So the fact that you have to feed everything in memory makes everything quite heavy, we can say. So your laptop gets very heavy. And the problem is that um, Pandas was not meant for these huge data sets that we have nowadays. So that's why we also have some other solutions in place. And um, we did, the, I, th I think the community, the, the contributors did a lot of work in this direction, but it's still one of the biggest limitations of Pandas. Are there solutions? Yes, but still Pandas works like this. Uh, lack of parallelism. This is probably one of the biggest problems, I think, nowadays, because we have very, very powerful machines. We can use our CPUs, but we don't have uh, multi-trading by default with Pandas. It's not implemented. Still, there are some tricks, but it's not like having a language that... Uh, implements multi-trading in the core. And then we have these suboptimal data types who did work a lot with Pandas knows what I'm talking about. That means that in Pandas you have a mix of types, types coming from NumPy, from Python, and all these libraries. And Pandas works like magic, as we can see in this, in this example. But sometimes it's not the magic you want. In this case, we're creating a dummy data, uh, data frame. And what happens is that Pandas assign this, um, which type is this? This uh, object data type for these column names. Uh, but I what I actually wanted is category. It's not what Pandas decided to do. And this has impacts on the operation you want to do afterwards. Sometimes a very huge impact. Some models cannot even work with this data. So this is the magic of Pandas. Some people say that um, Pandas work, as I said, works like magic because you don't have to think about these operations. But in my case, this can also create problems because you don't have control on the things you're doing. And one last point to understand the things we're going to see later is Arrow, the bridge of data. Arrow, if you don't know, is a, a kind of cross-language platform, and it basically connects all these data platforms together. You can imagine that before, uh, if we wanted to move something from Spark to Cassandra, we had to serialize data, deserialize data, save it somewhere. These operations were very expensive. Now we have Arrow, which is a shared memory, and we don't have to take care of serializing and deserializing data. We can just rely on Arrow. And this is a big, big change in terms of um, letting these um, data, da data applications cooperate uh, with each other. And that's why in Pandas 2.0, we had an implementation of Arrow, which is PyArrow. And uh, yeah, here is a small example, but 
you can trust me that Arrow does the job. Now, let's finally move to Polaris. We know everything about Pandas. There is nothing more. We're all experts. We can dive into Polaris. First of all, Polaris, I think it doesn't mean anything. I think that they wanted to call it Polaris because Polaris are basically stronger than Pandas. I think this is the reason. RS, probably because of Rust. Policy is implemented with Rust, which makes everything super fast. And there are also some of the interesting things about Polaris. Um, first of all, um, it implements is implemented around Arrow. It's not the same as PyArrow. PyArrow in Panda is in an, an implementation of Arrow. In this case, Polaris is basically based on Arrow. That means that the way the memory is uh, used is, a completely, is completely different compared to Pandas, to PyArrow. Um, another important point is parallelism. You have parallelism by default. That basically means that with the power, powerful machines we have today, um, we can do operations that maybe are not as a huge, um, I mean, are not operations for, for which you require maybe Spark, but you can do it in your machine. You just need to use all the CPUs. You just need parallelism. Another point is lazy evaluation. We will see that lazy evaluation means that you can execute the code, but you decide when you want to collect the result. So maybe you have a bunch of operations, but you wait until the last moment to say, OK, give me the final number, 42 usually. And the core of Pandas, the core of Polaris is that um, it has implemented. It is implemented in, in Rust. Rust is as fast as C. This is what they say. And uh, believe me, that it's a huge difference compared to having something pre-compiled with Cyton. Um, something happened. Whatever. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> we go to the next slide. That was not important. Um, okay. Let's fight. We can move to the comparison. What are we going to see in this comparison? First, we will evaluate these two languages uh, as fair as we can. It, it, it's not a 100% fair comparison. Uh, this is just something that I did on my machine. You can try to replicate the data. If you don't get the exact decimal number, don't contact me, because it's very unlikely that you will do, but some people did it in some other presentations. I didn't know what to say, so don't, 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 don't text back. Anyways, um, we will evaluate computation time. We will check the syntax because it's another library. We're trying to do the same things that we do with Pandas. We want to see if we can copy with that. Uh, we will check the memory consumption and API's consistencies, which is the last point. Um, how I did run this test, I'm using my MacBook Pro. I think it's a very powerful machine. I guess. Um, I'm using this 30 million of rows data set with 15 columns, eight categorical. For the comparison, I'm using uh, time, classical time uh, from, from, from Python. Um, and uh, I'm evaluating the syntax, and I'm using memory. Memory uh, gives me, gives me um, a um, indication of how much memory I'm using. It's a profiling tool. So. First, reading data. We will go through some of the most common operations. Reading data. Um, we can already see from the results that uh, Polaris is the winner. We use less memory. It takes uh, 363 milliseconds compared to almost one second. And syntax-wise, it's almost the same. I'm using PyArrow here, as you can see with Pandas, because I want to make this comparison as fair as possible. Uh, but still, Polaris is definitely the winner this first round. Now we move to filter select and unique. Uh, also, really common operations we do with pandas very often. What is happening here is that, first of all, I'm not a big fan of this syntax. The point here is that um, I'm coming from pandas. I mean, I like pandas. I like the way uh, pandas works, and, and I'm used to this syntax. It's like one of the first things I learned when I, when I started working as a data scientist. So when I see something different, I'm always like, hmm, I feel like I'm a bit old for this new syntax. And what I see in this case is that um, this pl.call, uh, this, op this operator is, um, I don't know, I, I just don't like it. I'm like, why do I have to use this operator? So the first time I saw it, I don't know, it, it's, it's not really, it's very far away from my taste. Anyways, 
if we look at the performance, Polar is still the winner. I don't like the syntax, but look, it takes one second less. We move to aggregation. What happens? I'm trying here to re re replicate what I do, what I can do with this um, dot ag with pandas. I don't know if this is the best way to do it with polis. It's not that this is something you uh, do often with polis, but I, I, I wanted to replicate the final output. Uh, we have mean, max, medium, uh, uh, mean, standard deviation, and what's on. Um, still, the performance here are crazy. So Polas takes 443 milliseconds compared to 5 seconds. Memory-wise, yeah, it's better, but it's comparable. You can also um, actually play with pandas and, and uh, play with the memory usage a bit if you want to decrease it. But the performance here uh, are saying that Polas is again the winner. Syntax-wise, as I say, I don't really like the way I have to stack all these operations, but this is a very special use case. Uh, what if we create a new column? Again, Polas is the winner. But, once again, I have problems with the syntax because this dot .call is my nightmare. Why do I have to use it? I uh, think that the Polas community will, will kill me after this talk. Anyways, um, it's, re it's really important to evaluate the syntax here. Once again, okay, the performance is great, but we are human beings and we're moving from something that we know really well, well to something else. This is a new library, and hopefully, if you want to do this uh, change, you're going to um, replace a huge part of your code. So you need to be comfortable with the syntax. And now we move to um, our last operation, which is grouping and sort. Still very common. And I guess now we're running out of operations, by the way. Uh, grouping and sort. I'm saying lazy, because on the right, what I'm doing with Polas is lazy evaluation. So there is a comment, I don't know if you can see it, but until that point, we have almost zero seconds. Because we're just like evaluating the syntax, evaluating the operations, but we decide when we want to get the final number out of it. And this is really interesting and really powerful, especially if you have a very huge pipeline. Here, for the first time, I feel more comfortable with the syntax. The reason is that I l really love, when, when, when things get complicated, when you have a lot of operations, I really love how you can stack operations with Polas. Look at, look, look at Pandas. Yes, we're used to that, but it's a bit messy. On the right, we can stack each operation. We have the dot lazy, we have group by, aggregation, sort, and we can even add more operations. With Pandas, you probably have to create a new line, work with variables, uh, temporary variables whatsoever. But with Polas, you can, ha you, you can stack all these operations one on top of the other, and it makes the syntax, honestly, uh, way better. This is where I started seeing the light for the first time. But this is, this is what you usually do. Yeah. And last point, this is the kind of bonus point, API consistency and types. As I said, the problem with Pandas is that you have a lot of different types coming from everywhere. I don't know if you, if you, if you heard about this, but Pandas is a mix of types. Types from Python, from, from NumPy, maybe from, from Cydon, I don't know. And um, which type do I have to use? I, I don't know. Most of the times I find that out when something goes wrong, when my model is complaining, hey, I cannot handle categorical data. Why did you use that? I was like, I don't know, I didn't use it. Pandas decided for me. So I usually learn this by doing it because Pandas is a mix of all these things. And disclaimer, I'm not saying that Pandas is bad. I'm just saying that the problem here is that we're coming from an era where a very huge, very long period where we had to make a lot of decisions based on our needs. Our needs back then were different compared to the needs that we have right now. So API consistency is probably one of these problems. And what happens? Do you know how many things you can get out of dot .lock? You get this, uh, you can select a row, you can select multiple rows, you can select a specific item, you can select rows with a Boolean condition, you can modify a subset of a data frame. It's too many things for one function. I, I hope we all agree on this. 
And this, this can create collision. It, it, can, it, it gets very complicated. Some people like it because it gives you a lot of flexibility. But I call it consistency, especially when you have this stuff in production. Maybe the guy who, who, who implemented Pandas back then didn't think that in the future people will put Pandas in production. It was like, it's just something for me. No one will put it in production. And here we are with a lot of Pandas code in production. So, yeah, this can create some problem. With Polas, of course, they learn from these mistakes. You don't get these problems. You have only the right data types. One function does only one thing. That's the idea. So, we can say that Polas is probably the winner based on the things we evaluated Polas and Pandas on. But let's move to the final part of this presentation. So what's the future of the data frames? Because there is, there is more. Because now we're talking about something that can possibly replace pandas. But um, is it true that we can just get pandas, take pandas, throw it away, and use polas forever? Well, we still have some problems. First of all, integration. Pandas integrates with a lot of libraries. It's not the same for polas. Polas has a lot of problems. Uh, with scikit-learn, things are changing very fast, but I remember some years ago, also, there were a lot of problems with data connectors. Um, yeah, things are changing very fast, so maybe also this slide will get outdated very soon, I hope, but still, it, it, it is complicated. Uh, third point, probably the most important for me, ChatGPT doesn't know anything about Polis, so I cannot do my job. That's the point. Um, and it's, it's, it's very annoying because every time I have a question, I need to check the Polis documentation. It's fine. It's really, really well written, but sometimes I need some examples. And ChatGPT is still like, mm, not really coping with that. Um, it is definitely rooted in data manipulation. What does it mean? That Polis uh, has been implemented when we all knew what we wanted to do with these libraries. But before, we were not really talking about manipulating data with Python. Probably people were not really into that back then when Pandas was invented. Um, in my opinion, it is ideal for ETLs. So, Yes, Polas cannot really replace Pandas all the times, but if you have ETLs and you have performance issues, probably Polas is the right choice for you. And in my opinion, it advocates for data frame standardization. That basically means that, so what is happening right now with Polas and all this library is happening that we all have our implementation of something. Do you know how many implementation of mean do we have with different names, different signatures, different input parameters? Why? I think the mean works in only one way. So now we have all these libraries around, and I think we're moving in uh, the direction, into the direction of having some standards. We tried that in the past with some other languages. It didn't really work, but hopefully this is the right time for Python. And there is this data frame consortium that is trying to create standards around all these decisions. So yeah, it's nice that we have new libraries. We have uh, DuckDB, we have Dask, all these nice libraries but we need to work in the same direction. I think Polas is somehow advocating for these decisions, and hopefully, at some point, the mean will be the same for all these packages. So, in the end, who is gonna win this competition? I think that there is no one clear winner. It depends on your needs. Uh, this, uh, it's, it's, it's an easy, it's an easy uh, like answer to who is the winner, but in reality, it really depends on your needs. If you're working with ETL, you, you have, with, with ETLs and you have performance issues, maybe Polis is the right choice for you, but it depends. Are your colleagues willing to learn a new package and transform a, I don't know, huge code base into something else? It's still Python, but libraries in Python can be very different. So yeah, I don't believe that now Polis will replace Pandas, maybe not in the next five years, but things are gonna change very fast. Um, and yeah, hopefully we will see many new use cases in the future with Polis. And that's it for my presentation. I'll stay around for questions. Thank you.